Welcome back, fellow true crime enthusiasts, to today's case file, part four of the series, Who Murdered Jimmy Gall? Finding Jimmy. Who is Vandegrift? Welcome to Body of Crime, your go-to true crime podcast, where we plunge headfirst into the gripping world of criminal mysteries. Join your hosts, Jose Medina, Crystal Garcia, and Alicia Anaya, as we deliver the full stories, immersing you in the heart of each case. With spine-chilling cases, in-depth analysis, captivating interviews, and a comprehensive examination of the evidence, embark on a thrilling journey with us as we explore bone-chilling cases from around the globe. Whether you're a seasoned true crime enthusiast or a fresh face in the genre, we guarantee to keep you on the edge of your seat. So put on your detective hat, grab your notepad, and get ready to dive into the thrilling world of body of crime. In our last installment of the series, The Manuscript, Memories of the Little House, we delved into the manuscript that was mailed to Tracy Ferris, a manuscript written and composed by Lori Nelson, a childhood resident of the home that had lived in Tracy's new home 41 years prior. We followed the manuscript as it resurfaced almost 20 years later, reigniting interest in a case left cold for nearly six decades when the family who received it turned to social media for help in getting the case attention. It was then that Karen Lalonde, an independent investigator, embarked on a quest for truth driven by the desire to bring closure to a grieving family. As we began to investigate the case, one Citrus Heights resident that stood out amongst many others was Melford Burl Vandegrift, the 52-year-old father and teacher who discovered Jimmy's body in a field about 200 yards away from the Gall home. Vandergriff found Jimmy's remains in a depressed part of the field, covered with what most likely was alfalfa weeds to conceal the crime. Vandergriff found the young boy, a white fabric still wrapped around his small neck. This unfortunately thrust Vandergriff into the middle of the investigation, and he soon became a key person of interest as investigators moved to rule him out as a suspect. By finding Jimmy, Vandergriff became connected to Jimmy's fate as suspicions in the neighborhood ran high, with speculation from members of the community who found it too coincidental that he found Jimmy. Newspapers reported that Vandegrift had backed his truck right to the location where Jimmy was found. As investigators ran out of leads and no one was named a suspect, Vandegrift soon became a focal point for the community's fears and suspicions as people began wondering if he were more than just a good Samaritan. Some question whether he was an innocent bystander or a nefarious player with a more sinister involvement in the case. Some have wondered if Vandegrift held the key to unraveling the mystery that has weighed heavily on the community for so many years. Join us today as we peel back the layers of Vandegrift's persona, shedding light on the man who found Jimmy and whose presence looms large in the search for answers. Who is Vandegrift? Now when people are sharing their awful things that have happened and this is probably one of the worst things in our family history. My parents were so much older. They were old enough to be the parents of all the other parents. It was really nice. I mean, my mom was a like a master knitter. She'd have knitting classes and they just had more fun. And of course, everybody drank copious amounts of coffee back then. She'd have all the younger mothers over, you know, when their kids were in school. And so my mom, she was home during the winter and then she'd take a job at Aerojet in the summer. She was a stenographer, a very good one. But she would take a job in the summer because my dad was home because he was a teacher. So he'd watch us in the summer when we were home and then she'd be home during the winter when we were in school and dad was in school. And they'd all sit around and she'd teach them how to knit. And they would just laugh and have such a great time. Everybody loved her. Mom was a Christian scientist. She didn't 
drink or smoke or any of that stuff, and neither my parents really did. But she was especially kind and loving, I think, to everybody. She was such a loving, kind person. We were just kind of turned out in the morning, and we had that big field to play in. We were always in trouble because we would drag our dad shovels and hoes and trowels and things like that out to dig in the field. We were going to dig to China. My brother and Jimmy were very good friends, and my brother said he was supposed to spend the night at Jimmy's house that night, the night that he was murdered. They were close enough to do that. Bill, he always said, but, uh, you know, after listening to the podcast, everybody says they were his best friend. Bill is definitely very good friends with Jimmy. Dad wouldn't, he doesn't claim best friends. Often. Yeah, he, my brother's not. In fact, he really didn't have another best friend after that until he was a teenager. I, it seemed like our neighborhood was stable for so long. The, all the people that lived there always lived there. But I have a feeling that's probably related to being young and the fact that, you know, if you're four to seven years old, that's three years and it seems like a lifetime <laughs> when you're a kid. Our neighborhood probably was in a state of flux. All these young people and they were, it wasn't a fancy neighborhood. You've probably seen pictures. It was a tract home. These people were fairly well educated people who were coming up in the world. Yeah, we had a lot of great people in the neighborhood. But like I said, our folks were so much older. Dad was, he just kind of watched out for things that he could do with kids. Like he'd make stilts. And then we'd all take turns walking the stilts around until somebody got hurt. You know? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it was, it was a fun place. To learn about Vandegrift, we will first have to travel back to 1911, where his story began. This was a much simpler time compared to today with less reliance on technology and more emphasis on traditional forms of entertainment and social interaction. Imagine bustling city streets alive with the clatter of horse-drawn carriages and the rhythmic chug of steam trains, while automobiles, though emerging, remained a luxury beyond reach for many. Amidst the hustle and bustle, labor-intensive industries like manufacturing and agriculture powered the heartbeat of the economy. Fashion was a spectacle of elegance as women adorned themselves in flowing skirts and elaborate bonnets, while men donned suits with high collars and distinguished hats. Entertainment flourished with vaudeville shows enchanting audiences with a medley of comedy, music, and dance. Silent films flickered to life, introducing stars like the legendary Charlie Chaplin to the world stage. In the realm of innovation, the automotive era gave birth to powerhouse companies like Ford and Chevrolet, who were in the process of revolutionizing travel. Pioneers in aviation were just starting to take to the skies, pushing the boundaries of human achievement. Yet, amidst the glamour and progress, the world was in flux. The Mexican Revolution raged, challenging the grip of dictatorship while social movements for women's suffrage and workers' rights gained momentum. William Howard Taft occupied the White House as the 27th President of the United States of America. I am willing to admit that war has accomplished much in the progress of the world. I am willing to admit that there are certain crises in the forward march of Christian civilization that perhaps could not have been met in any other way than by the torch. I'm willing to admit that war develops certain heroic traits in men and furnishes a test for the evidence of the highest character. Perhaps, too, it trains and disciplines people. But the other side of the picture justifies the prayer of every man, of every civilized man, that war should be abolished. The Vandegrift settled in Kansas after the Civil War as the state engaged in several land distribution programs to encourage settlement and development in the state. William Henry Vandegrift, or Harry as everyone knew him, was a 38-year-old farmer who married 17-year-old Nora Myrtle Newell in Ness City, Kansas on November 17, 1892. They would have several children, four daughters and four sons, which included one set of twins. Melford Burl Vandergriff would be the second to the last born on November 28, 1911, an adventurous Sagittarius who would affectionately be known as Van or Red amongst his friends. Van would enter the world on a ranch nestled in the heart of Nest City, Kansas when his father, Henry, who was originally from Delaware, was 58 years old, and his mother, Nora Myrtle Newell Vandergriff, who was from Missouri, was 36. His roots were diverse. 
Van's upbringing was shaped by the resilience of farm life, which included hard work, a large family, and lots of animals. He would learn to drive at eight years old and often drove his father around. Right as the Great Depression began in 1929, Van's 75-year-old father, Harry, passed away when Van was just 17 years old. After suffering the significant loss of his father and being held back in school for a year due to illness, Van graduated in 1930. In September of 1936, 24-year-old Van married his first wife, Maxine Gibson, a 20-year-old salesgirl from Nebraska in Benkelman, Nebraska. The marriage would be short-lived, lasting less than five years, ending in January 1941. Just one year later, Van embarked on a thrilling journey when he enlisted in the Navy during World War II in February of 1942. He would marry his second wife in June of 1942. 32-year-old Swedish North Dakota native and department store sales girl, Virginia Adeline Kussler Elkison, who everyone called Mimi or Virgie. Van was 33 years old. It would be the second marriage for both, and they would marry in Denver, Colorado. Mimi was a single parent to a young 12-year-old daughter named Betty Lou. Soon, Van found himself in the heart of action in the Pacific Theater, assigned to the legendary USS Hilo. He was in Australia, New Zealand, New Guinea, all these places. He said some of those islands, they were like the first white people that the people there had ever seen. He had the time of his life, but he was in his 30s when the war broke out. So he had a totally different experience than, you know, the younger guys that were there. And he didn't ever see any action. I won't say he was a pacifist, but he was anti-Vietnam War. And he said... He would be all for war if it could be like his experience was. He played golf in Australia. <laughs> he hung out with all the officers and stuff because he was an older guy, you know. Yeah. They called him Plato. He was a philosopher and mathematician. He just read philosophy. and I think they had him as a medic for a little while because they didn't have a medic. And he just had enough life experience that he could, you know, set a broken thumb or something. But he just had a wonderful time during the war. Van's role was pivotal, as the ship provided crucial maintenance and repair services for PT boats while supporting training exercises and operations across the Pacific. Van's second marriage, much like the first, would end in a divorce, with Van as the plaintiff citing cruel and inhumane treatment just four years into their marriage and without having any children in January of 1946. I think he was in a bad marriage. That was kind of the explanation that we got. He said he was either going to take a shotgun and throw it over his shoulder and hike up into the mountains until the war blew over or enlist. So he ended up enlisting. All he wanted to do, I've read his letters to his mother. She was born in 1875 and died in 1976. So she was an older parent too. But I don't think they raised kids back then. They just had them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they were part of the they, help. They, they were part of they the... Were, exactly. <laughs> they were field hands, yeah. The letters that he wrote to his mother, all he wanted to do when he got home was to move to Eugene, buy an acre or two where he could have a calf and a pig and some chickens and a vegetable garden. And that's all he wanted to do. He just wanted a simple life. After two failed marriages, the U.S. Navy veteran Van took a short break from women, or at least marriage, for almost a decade. He seized the opportunity to further his education by utilizing the GI Bill he had earned for his military service. He received graduate degrees in history, economics, and literature from the University of Oregon. In 1954, the 42-year-old aquarist met and married his soulmate, 37-year-old Latha Louise Lehman, a stenographer from Oregon whom everyone called Lee. The couple tied the knot in Grants Pass, Oregon. The marriage to Lee would be Van's third and Lee's second. When they married, Lee was the single parent of a nine-year-old boy named Brian. Ready to start his own family, Van would turn down a doctorate in curriculum development from Columbia University, and soon the couple made their way to the Sacramento, California area of Citrus Heights, where they would lay their roots in a neighborhood where most of the neighbors worked for Aerojet. It was a popular military and veteran community. Van would become a teacher, in addition to creating and breeding albino Aeneas catfish. He was a member of the Sacramento Aquarium Society and the Los Palmas Junior High School PTA. Lee, on the other hand, was a member of the Citrus Heights Cooperative Nursery. At the age of 43, 
Van and his 38-year-old wife would have their first child and only daughter, Cheryl, in July of 1955. In 1957, the Vandegrifts welcomed their second child and only son together, William Carl Vandegrift, whom everyone would come to know as Bill. Though typically always the older parents in the neighborhood, the Vandegrifts valued family above all else and were active in their children's and eventually their grandchildren's lives. They were strong advocates of education, sports, and extracurricular activities. So it was no surprise when the soulmates decided to adopt two additional children, a brother and a sister, who were in the foster care system after their children became adults. In 1975, Van retired as a teacher and became even more involved with the large family they had built over the years. Van passed away in December of 1997 at the age of 86 years old, surrounded by his family in Boise, Idaho. Vandegrift came into the world in a time when things were very, very different. So we had um, some very political things going on. We had some wartime things going on. Racism was still very big back then as well. Where his family settled in Kansas, there also was a lot of areas in Kansas where they were offering up property. So a lot of former slaves would migrate to Kansas and Van would interact with them a lot. And so he played sports with them and having been born in that time frame and then being exposed to what he was. And obviously this would mean that his family, that he also had a good family unit as well. But he was a very intelligent, open minded, ahead of his times, like old soul, um, which I think was very unique for him. And in talking to his family, we definitely learned more about that, which was pretty interesting. One of the things that was unique about Van's father was that he didn't do a lot of driving. As a matter of fact, he basically didn't drive for as long as he possibly could, which is one of the reasons that Van started driving as young as he was. So he was known to always be out with his horses, having his horses out. Right. So that was very unique. And of course, this is right around the time where vehicles were kind of first coming in and a lot of families couldn't afford to get vehicles. A lot of families didn't have vehicles anyway. I kind of think about that kind of like technology is today for older people because a lot of older people aren't ready to embrace technology. It's something new. They have to learn it. So I think back then cars for elderly would be like, oh, this is just too much. Like it's too much for me to learn. I got to do my legs and I got to do my hands too at the same time. <laughs> it was not something that they probably would have been excited about learning. That's funny. I didn't even think of it that way. Yeah. And also... Van had a large family. He had a lot of siblings. And yeah. so I would say more than, you know, most people would have today for sure. And, you know, I think about things like doing laundry for that many kids because you don't have a washer and dryer. I think about, you know, like school back then didn't last that long either. Typically school ran from like December to February. Think about that for a year, December to February. That's not very long. No. So school didn't last very long either. So your kids were home a lot and probably because they worked a lot, to be honest. True. During this time, this was when silent films came out. So they didn't have like TVs or most family didn't have TVs. And of course, they certainly didn't have cartoons. And these kids were used to playing outside and communicating with one another. And things were just very different. It looks like Van would go through two failed marriages before finding the right person. And I wonder if that was tied to like his maturity. Like, was he too young to get married? Like, you know, I kind of felt like they were probably not wanting to be alone. And I'm just making a guess. But, you know, back then it was very common that everybody was kind of pushed to hey, get married, like have a partner. And, you know, that could have been part of it. But also he did. He got married, which I wouldn't say real young, but he got married young and they didn't stay married very long. And in his first marriage, actually what was cited, he was the plaintiff in both divorces. And the first marriage, what was cited is basically abandonment. And so my guess is that she took off and he ended up filing for divorce. So she just kind of disappeared. And then um, the second wife, you know, same thing. They weren't married very long either, probably approximately around the same amount of time. But then in that divorce, he cited cruel and inhumane treatment. And 
he wasn't married very long. Now with that second wife, she did have a daughter, but this was also during the time where he left. So he, that second marriage, he pretty much was gone for a good portion of it. Right. I was going to say, I'm not really surprised about the second divorce because the war was right in the middle of that, which means he would have been going to training, then he would have been deploying, and then he would have been gone, and he would have been on a ship across the world. Like, that's the perfect storm for a divorce. Like, even now, like, divorce is real high amongst the military community, especially during deployments. And so if you think now, like, we've instituted a lot of things within the military to be able to communicate with your loved ones while you're deployed. And they didn't have that back then. Yeah, not you to were mention, gone. yeah, not to mention you're on a ship, like you're gone, you're gone. So like yeah. you don't hear from that person until they show back up. <laughs> oh, well, they were writing letters, but you know, that letter took a long time to come. Like, you know, but just imagine the feeling of that, what that would feel like when you get a letter from your loved one and from like some foreign country, like you're that must so have been excited. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was like Christmas. Yeah. Tell me about his uh, his breeding of fish. Uh, it seems like he gets into some type of uh, aquatic like hobby or something. So I know that in our interview, his daughter Cheryl had told us that he had always said that fish was what he did for work to make money and that teaching was his hobby. Like that's really what, like what he loved to do. And so he was extremely brilliant. He had multiple degrees. I remember when I was going through his his statement, I saw a word that I had never seen before. And I was like, that has to be made up. <laughs> that has to be a made up word. And so, of course, I Google it and I'm like, gosh, darn it, that's a word. Yeah. <laughs> I never heard that word before. <laughs> and so then I was looking at what it meant. I thought it was really funny, but definitely a brilliant man. So it's no surprise to me that he created a way back then to make money and to do something unique. So that particular fish was the first of its kind and he ran with that. So right. and I, th I think what it was is he was breeding albino fish that he would take the anomaly of an albino catfish and he would breed the albino catfish so that there was a higher probability of having more albino catfish. And so he bred them into existence and then he sold them as a, like a collector's item. And people were buying them all over the world, which I think is just phenomenal, especially during the time, obviously, where he was alive. So very unique. One thing that's important to understand about Van, and I kind of learned this in our conversation with Cheryl, is that he was very cerebral. He very. was a philosopher. He was a thinker. He says, at our dinner table, we had great philosophical conversations. And that's what it was like at our dinner table. And he was also, like you said earlier, he was very forward thinking in terms of society as a whole and integrating with other people and other religions and other nationalities and things like that. And I think it's such a beautiful thing. You know, she laughs about their parents being older. And she had told me that people would always think that their parents were their grandparents. And they used to think it was so funny. And I asked her if it ever like hurt her parents feelings, like if they ever felt bad about it. And she's like, no, they laughed about it. But I was thinking, you know, the unique thing is that they were at an age when they started having children where they were a little bit wiser, they were more educated, they had more experience in the world. And so they were able to bring something to the table with their kids that a lot of parents can't because of when they have their kids. Right. So I think that was very unique for them. They both not only were active in things that their children did and very supportive of the things that their children and eventually their grandchildren did, but also in the community. So Van was a member of the Sacramento Aquarium Society, and he would often do speaking engagements. He would judge different competitions that had to do with fish. I think it's really cool that he was so diverse, both of them so diverse in what they were doing and, you know, what they got their kids into and, you know, their kids read. He was a poet. And so it just, I, I just think it's, it was super cool. Learning details from newspaper articles, the media, and the memories of those who have attempted to recall details decades and generations later is very difficult. Fortunately, we have Vandergriff's own words as captured in 1964 in a written statement that Vandergriff provided to detectives outlining his search for Jimmy and has never been shared publicly before, but will provide some insight and answer some questions for the community who found it odd that Vandergriff continued his search for Jimmy early the next morning after he went missing. On Saturday, May 3rd, 1964, Van arrived home and was sitting at the dinner table when Lee shared that Jimmy was missing. In fact, Lee had received a phone call from Dolores Gall, Jimmy's mother, asking if Cheryl or Bill had seen Jimmy, letting her know that Jimmy was missing. 
Bill and Jimmy had been close friends. Lee was also friends with Dolores, and Van had been tutoring Dolores as she worked to complete her accounting degree. Lee expressed concern about Jimmy's disappearance and told Van that people were getting worried about the boy, who had been missing since about 2.30 p.m. earlier that day. Van could see that Lee was very concerned, and so he told his wife that he would eat and then go look for Jimmy. At about 6, 6.15 p.m., Van loaded up his two children, 8-year-old Cheryl and 6-year-old Bill, and the trio went out to search for Jimmy. Van had a feeling that the boy might have gotten himself into some trouble on a childhood adventure of either tree climbing or crawling through some pipes and might not be able to get himself out of a tough situation. He also thought Jimmy might have ventured off to the nearby carnival alone. My dad, you'd ask what kind of dad he was. He asked us questions. He talked to us like people. And so he wanted to know our thoughts and where we thought he would be. And I think that's why we searched so much around the big trees because that was probably because that was my favorite place to play. <laughs> so, yeah, I remember going out with dad. I think I do, you know, with my dad and my brother and showing him where Jimmy's fort was and, and that's where he ended up going back. He remembered and I think he, I don't think that when he found Jimmy, I don't think that was the first time he'd gone back there. In that letter, it says he kept going. He went back a couple of times. Yeah. But Cheryl was saying, like, your memory of looking, you're like, I, you don't think he was there earlier. I don't. Uh-uh. I think what my dad did was sat in the pickup. And this is, it was a 48 Willys Jeep truck. It started with a screwdriver. And I'm not saying that this is true, but <laughs> there could have been issues with he couldn't take his foot off the brake. He kicked us around and he'd, you know, go look over there and we'd go and look. And I can't imagine us going to, to look there and not going in it. They first looked near a storm drain where they saw two neighborhood boys departing as they left. Van asked Bill to show him where the boys had built their fort in the field where all the kids played. As Van idled the truck, the two children would get out and look for Jimmy, calling his name and listening for cries of the missing boy. They drove around looking in and around the trees where the kids had a tree fort once, and Cheryl liked to hang out. They even drove to the carnival on Auburn and down near the Shell Station, the kids searching along the sides of the creek, but there was no sign of Jimmy. After several hours of searching, they returned home, feeling defeated, and Cheryl went with Lee while Bill remained with Van. Van, refusing to throw the talon too quickly, went back out, driving up Carriage Drive at least two more times, all the way to the fence by the orchards, and drove up and down all the roads leading up that way, scanning through the trees and brush, hoping to spot Jimmy. Once a little before dark, I came back by the house and a neighbor was organizing a search. I went to the area west of the big field, west of my house, and talked to lots of people and questioned many children. For a second time, Van returned home, unsuccessful, his concern growing as the sun dipped and the night got cooler. He could imagine a scared and wet Jimmy, hurt or stuck somewhere nearby, waiting to be rescued. At about 10, I suppose, it was dark at least, I came by the house and the firemen were there and the chief was organizing a search of the area between Jimmy's house and the park. Many thought quite strongly he had gone to the carnival by himself. Refusing to quit, Van joined a group of firefighters, jumping into one of their fire trucks and riding with them to the end of carriage, before heading to the bridge of the creek that comes from the park down on Antelope Road. He knew Jimmy would feel better if there were a familiar face amongst the sea of rescuers when they found him. Most of the men went down to the creek toward Hidden Village, but three of us went toward the park. I searched the north side, came back to the bridge, and searched the south side. Two other men, one that lives in Unit 2 someplace, had searched the little branch that follows up along the road, and we met over by the bridge at Auburn. We walked back to the cars at the bridge on Antelope and talked a few minutes. After a little, Gene Baxter came by in his folks, and I rode back to Jimmy's house with him. Lots of people were milling around the house by that time, and the women were feeding them coffee. After some time, exhaustion and the cold wet of spring began to wane the resilience of the searchers, and the police told the men to go home and get some sleep. Lee, who had been supporting the search with some of the other women of the neighborhood, had sent Bill to stay with the neighbor as had Cheryl, allowing Van and Lee to continue searching for Jimmy and supporting the Gall family throughout the ordeal. 
As Van headed home, he swung by and picked up Bill. The house where Cheryl had been was dark, and not wanting to wake the family, he decided to let Cheryl remain there until the morning. Van would catch a few hours of sleep, drifting off at about 2 o'clock a.m., but by 5 a.m., he awoke to see that Lee had just returned from the Gall residence. She had been unable to sleep and had spent much of the night with Dolores. We talked a while, and she told me of a car that had been seen by Jimmy's father in the field when he first started looking, and on returning to it for a check, found it gone. She said she was going out to look for tracks. I told her that as soon as I looked to see who won the ball game that night before, because it was in the 11th, the last thing I heard before that, I would eat a bite and be out to search. Lee had explained to Van that someone had seen a car out by the field, and Lee was adamant about going out and looking for tire tracks that might lead to an injured or hurt Jimmy. Van told Lee that he would go out and look for the tire tracks. Van first checked the storm drain and then drove up along where the trees were again, repeating the same route from the day prior. I then went to the two big oaks almost directly across the street and through the lot from Jimmy's house, then went south up the fences toward Windlock. Whenever the hatch was high and I could not see where I was going, I got out and walked. I was afraid I might run over him. I drove the truck mostly where I could see and searched the high weeds afoot. As Van was searching, he came to an area where he was unable to see and turned into the field, with his truck facing west. As he was searching the area, he saw an area where weeds appeared unnaturally trampled down, almost like a partial clearing with a pile of weeds in the middle. At this time, my truck was facing west, a few feet in from the sidewalk. I got out and searched the high stuff on the left of the ditch, south side, then walked around the west end of the patch and was searching along the right or north of the patch. About 20 feet in front of my truck, I saw a place where the weeds were trampled down and there was a pile of them in the middle of the trampled down place or partial clearing. I can remember being startled or frightened. I had been searching for the boy as a neighbor in citizen's duty, but I must admit I was not prepared to find him, at least not dead. I went quickly to the weeds. I could see no part of his body Contrary to the statement in the newspaper, I lifted the weeds and he lay on his back, feet apart, arms at his side, but not closely, naked. A little blood was on the corner of his mouth and I thought a white piece of clothing by his neck, but the weeds kept me from seeing if it went around his neck. I saw no mutilation. I stood up and the thought quickly flashed, if he was alive, he must be hurried for aid. I will take him. If he is dead, I will leave him as undisturbed as possible so the police can get clues. I dropped to his side to feel for pulse. There was none. He was stiff. I ran to my truck and started home. Van was in a panic and quickly cut through the neighbor's yard. The route had been blocked off to prevent easy access to the field. Van parked his truck on the south side of the street and ran across the street to his house. He instructed Lee to call the police immediately. This would have been before the 911 system, and Lee accidentally called the wrong number, getting a hold of a highway patrol instead of the sheriff. The highway patrol department offered to inform the sheriff's office via radio, but Van knew time was of the essence. He didn't want anyone else finding Jimmy, especially not his father, and so he asked Lee to call the sheriff. Lee reached the Sacramento County Sheriff's Department. The call was received by the sheriff's office at approximately 7.32 a.m. Law enforcement asked Van if Jimmy was dead. Van responded that although he was sure the boy was deceased, it needed to be verified. To avoid drawing attention to the site, where Jimmy's body was, emergency vehicles met at Van's home, where Van would escort them to the location. As Van escorted the first officer to the location of Jimmy's body, he could see a foot sticking out from under the weeds that covered him. The sheriff confirmed that Jimmy was indeed deceased and concluded that Jimmy had been strangled to death. Lee asked a neighbor to contact a minister to have on standby for the Gull family and to position themselves near the Gull residence to prevent any of the Gull family members from accidentally stumbling upon the scene. A separate neighbor came to tell the police of a car he had seen that had been parked in the field and had quickly driven away earlier. Van's account of the details of that day became a very important part of the investigation. I remember mom talking to us about it because dad just, he either he couldn't or mom just didn't want him to have to talk right. to us about what had happened and 
you know, we all knew he was missing, and that's why the neighborhood was in such turmoil. Just mom telling us if we had any questions to ask her, because she didn't want dad to have to talk to us about it, because he was just too, too shook up. He loved children so much. It was beyond him to even think of of anybody harming a child. We know that because your your father is the one who found Jimmy, that obviously whenever someone finds someone who's deceased, they're going to question them because they, they were on the scene. Dad, was your dad concerned about that in terms of just wanting to make sure that he wasn't implicated in any kind of way or anything like that? Absolutely. Yeah, no, he was he was really upset about that. I, I was reading some of those old newspaper articles, too. I couldn't believe they put our home address, where he worked, the classes he taught. Oh, my God. I mean, everything about him on the front page of the Sacramento Bee. Why on earth would you do something? All it takes is one crazy person to think, that guy probably did it and come after right. you, you know? I remember talking to him later. And I think because it was never solved, that he was explaining to me about being questioned and being like, I wouldn't say he was a suspect, but I, in my naive way, said, you know, something about, you don't have to worry about it, about it because you didn't do anything wrong. And he said, you know, honey, the, there's prisons full of innocent men. And I believe that. I believe, I think he was ahead of his time with his thinking process. That's so true. Quite a unique thing to think back then for sure. When you're looking into a case and you don't have everything available to you, it's like having missing pieces of a puzzle. You know, you have gaps. Sometimes we try to fill those gaps based on the larger piece of the puzzle that we're able to see. So one of the reasons that Vandegriff came up as a person of interest is because he did find Jimmy's body. And in some of the articles after Jimmy was found, there was a couple statements that were made that seemed a little odd, such as he backed up his truck and got out on foot and found him right there. Well, that makes it sound like he knew exactly where to go. He backed up. And then, you know, neighbors would say people didn't really drive around. They mostly walked everywhere and he lived so close to the field. Why would he drive all the way over there? So there was a lot of different things that came out amongst some of the different neighbors, things that had been heard over the years. And, you know, even in our own research, when we're digging into this case and you start looking at, you know, what happened to Jimmy, he started moving up to the top of the list of people of interest. Is that common? It is. It is common. So in any case, take, for example, you know, the murder of a spouse the spouse who is still living is typically one of the first people that they try to rule out. So they start close and they move outwards. So in the process of the investigation that the police were doing, they of course questioned Vandegrift because Vandegrift found him. So how did you find him? How did you come about finding him? And of course they asked him for his alibi, which he gave. He has a full timeline of his actions the day that Jimmy went missing and then up until the point where he found Jimmy. Gotcha. Um, there's receipts for those things, the different places where he went, the different people that he spoke with. It's very detailed. What's really interesting about his statement is that a lot of the things that had been brought up by different neighbors and different rumors that had come up, things that were in the paper, things that the police were investigating or looking for. Some of those things are mentioned in the statement. And so it's been really helpful to be able to read that. And the Vandegrift family shared that with us. And I truly appreciate that because they filled in some gaps for us that we otherwise wouldn't have been able to. So I think that's very unique. I think it's important to know also that Vandegrift really felt connected to the Gall family. His son was friends with Jimmy. They played a lot together. 
he was tutoring Dolores. Like it wasn't like some random family down the road. And so of course he had a little bit more incentive than just a regular neighbor to continue looking for Jimmy. He knew Jimmy. Well, and then the other thing too, is that during the time when the neighbors were looking for Jimmy and you know, what's interesting is that we've heard some different comments from different people in the neighborhood about the searches and it's really unique to see in writing from somebody during that time who was an adult saying this is what happened and they're giving you a like a play by play. A, yeah, a play by play of everything that's happening. And so you're seeing that they're searching different areas from what we've been hearing. They're doing different things from what we've been hearing. And it's unique. We're very blessed again to have it, honestly. The other thing too is that With Lee being at the Gall family's home, she was there while all the guys were out searching and the women were making coffee. He talked about the women that, you know, that when he got to the house, that the women were making coffee and giving coffee to the guys because, of course, they're tired. It's the middle of the night. And, you know, most of them have worked all day and then got home and are going out, you know, and doing the search in the middle of the night. It's dark. You know, there was a number of different things that occurred um, that are mentioned in the statement, like a ladder, you know, somebody bringing a ladder out at one point. And, You know, the Vandergriffs really did a good job as well of protecting the Gall family and that like getting a minister. The police had actually told um, Vandergriff's wife, like, hey, don't call anybody. Don't, you know, like. Yeah, keep it hushed. Yeah. And she took it upon herself, which as a good friend, I would probably do this too. But she took it upon herself to get a hold of a minister and said, hey, we need you on standby. And then they kept the Gall family from, you know, one of the neighbors kept the Gall family from coming out to just prevent them from having an experience that they just couldn't erase from their mind. And so I think that was a beautiful thing. Then, you know, with Lee having been at the house with Dolores that evening and then into the early morning hours, you know, her coming home and telling her husband like, Hey, like he had only gotten a little bit of sleep and she came home and she's like, Hey, um, Jimmy's dad saw this car and I want to go look for tracks. Like think about Lee's mindset. Cause she also has a little boy the same age as Jimmy And so in her mind, she's playing, this could have been my son that's missing. And I would want everyone out there look like she's not going to bed. She also knew Jimmy. She was very close friends with Dolores. And I'm sure that, you know, she was feeling Dolores's pain. We've spoken to a lot of people and it's heartbreaking when you're a parent who has children and a parent's talking to you about their loss. It's just unfathomable. I'm sure that Lee felt that. Right. And wanted to do everything in her power possible that she could think of to help bring Jimmy home. And I think that was the, really the catalyst for what really pushed Van to go back out early that morning is because Lee was like, I heard there was a car out there and I want to go out there and look for tracks. And he's like, honey, stay home. I'm going to go look for the tracks. <laughs> you know, I got this. You stay here with the kids. I'm going to go out and look again. Well, and also the way that his vehicle was faced actually wasn't backed up. So just for everybody's awareness, it was actually faced like he pulled in in order for him to leave and go home, which in his statement, it doesn't say which way he entered. But we've been able to confirm that in order for him to have gone around the area that was kind of blocked off for his house at the time, he would have had to go through the neighbor's yard. Now it does appear based on his statement, we're pretty positive that he went through the neighbor's yard when he went home to have Lee call the sheriff's department. And that's based on how he was parked and the side of the street that he was parked on. That's really kind of the only way that it made sense. Right. He was also very deliberate not to race home and arouse attention from where he was driving from because he didn't want to alert anybody else to go out there and disturb the scene. So yeah. he was very conscious of that in his statement. He says, I, I had to really try not to speed home. I had to drive normally in order to avoid someone from coming out and discovering the scene as well. Right. Because, of course, no cell phones back then. So he had to go home and, and leave Jimmy lying there to come home and call the police. You know, And in his mind when he stood up, because he had that first, that instinctual, like, being startled, being scared. So he stood up and then he was like, I need to confirm whether or not he's alive. I need to, ch- I need to check because if he needs help, I need to take him for help. And so that's when he bent down to try to check for a pulse and then got up and, you know, he even talks about the sound of his engine and going home and, you know, like he just, he didn't want anybody to come and disturb the scene to where the police couldn't get clues. Right. So very smart. Yeah. Very smart. 
He then begins to serve as kind of like a liaison with a law enforcement where they're all coming to his house and using his house as a focal point for gathering. And then he's walking them out to the scene um, in order to keep cars from going over there and everybody from finding out what's happening out in the field. So it's kind of a way to keep like what's happening under wraps until they can figure out what happened. What's also interesting is that, you know, when something happens and, it, you know, and obviously it would have been more so his neighbors around his area that would have been kind of alerted to what was going on. He said that after the first couple people asked him what was going on, that he didn't want to tell them that Jimmy didn't have clothes on because he didn't want Jimmy's family to find out prior to the police being able to notify Jimmy's family. So he just was very aware of protecting the impact to Jimmy's family and trying to be as respectful as possible in that process. This is also the period of time where some of the rumors are born about what happened with Jimmy, because a lot of people begin to fill in some of the blanks and it's kind of like the game of telephone. People start adding and, you know, conjecturing and filling in some of their own blanks based off what they're hearing from other, you know, from some of the officials, some of the police, the newspapers, they're also trying to write a story as well. And so a lot of information then gets a little bit convoluted. And so this kind of starts the rumor mill that eventually leads to some suspicions amongst the neighborhood and things like that. You know, and that's something to keep in mind because, it, you know, that's how it all starts, you know, wading your way through that and, Finding out what the truth is, is extremely important. During this time, you know, one of the things that we talked to Cheryl about was how things felt at home after this occurred. And of course they were young. So there's some things that as a child, like you're remembering as a child, like, well, yeah, I found out, you know, like when I woke up, but their mom was very good about telling them ask me what you want to ask me. Like, let's talk about this. I don't want you to talk to your father because Lee really felt like he just was, he was really torn up about it. And she was trying to do the best job she could at being open and honest with her children, but also trying to prevent a little bit of the, the discomfort that Van was going through at the time. This is during a time where men aren't supposed to cry. Men aren't supposed to really express emotion. And this was an emotional thing for Van. This would have been an emotional thing for Van. He had little kids the same age as Jimmy. This would have been a, a crime that resonated and was impactful to Van. And so obviously his mom would not want him to be re-victimized with what he had found and what he had seen and what he had experienced because obviously it was emotional. And the other thing too is that when he was in the military, he didn't see combat. That was one of the things that we talked about that we were curious about. But regardless, I have, and I've seen a lot of trauma and children is one of the things that almost everybody has a hard time with, regardless of how long they've been in the medical field or the emergency services field or the law enforcement field. Children always is much harder to deal with when you face it. You can really create this kind of numbness, this kind of shell when you're dealing with adults and with the elderly. But with children, it's just very different because you don't picture them leaving the world so early. Yeah. And for people who are parents, it becomes even harder because you have a certain level of empathy as a parent as well. In my deployments, whenever we had to deal with the loss of a child's life, it was always super impactful as opposed to dealing with the loss of life of an adult. So 100% I agree with that. I think that the media did a pretty lousy job of covering the facts and maybe not intentional. I think they reported a story and typically the media would do this. They'll report the story based off what they know now. The statements that they put into the newspaper aren't 100% factual, but when they're read, they're read as if they are 100% factual. So when they say things like he backed his car up to the location where, and then he got out and he found Jimmy, that becomes a fact. Right. And I think it's important because we need to realize that sometimes the news gets it wrong. And the other thing too, is that there wasn't anybody out there with him. Even the neighbors are getting, the majority of them would be getting their facts from the newspaper. 
And you know, if I was expecting to find a child deceased, I probably wouldn't go by myself. I probably would have took somebody with me. He did not expect to find a deceased child. No. He 100% expected to find someone who was alive, who was hurt, who needed help. And that's kind of what he was thinking he was going to find. If he found Jimmy, he expected to find Jimmy alive. That's why they were calling for him. That's why they were yelling out his name. No one expected to find him deceased. And he talks in his statement when he saw the trampled down area and he started walking in that direction to investigate what was going on in that part of the field, he was afraid. He felt fear. I think he just kind of knew. Like the feeling was like this doesn't look normal. You know, he had been looking the day before. You know, he had taken Cheryl and Bill out. And I think he just probably kind of had an eerie feeling and was thinking like this isn't what I was expecting and obvious in his reaction as well. And what a blessing that little Bill and Cheryl didn't find the body the prior day when they were searching. That would have been super traumatic for two children to have stumbled upon the body of their friend. That would have been very traumatic for them, for sure. And I'm sure he appreciated that, that it was him instead who had to face that instead of his children. And again, he wouldn't have wanted his, his children to have to see that. No, absolutely not. It's easy to understand why some of the residents of Citrus Heights questioned Van's involvement in the crime. Finding a body is a surefire way to be accused of a crime. Even in today's age, people who stumble upon a deceased individual are often initially viewed as a person of interest, as are close family members. Investigations typically begin close to the victim and circle out, as most violent crimes are committed by those we know, and are rarely strangers and even more rarely random. If Vandergriff initially emerged as a person of interest, he was quickly ruled out as a potential suspect. He had been the unfortunate witness to a terrible tragedy, one that would change him permanently as a father, as a teacher, and as a man. I don't think he would have even considered not. I don't, it wouldn't yeah. have even crossed his mind to not do the right thing. It's interesting reading that statement that Cheryl found. And even the stuff that you guys, I looked into this 10 years ago and couldn't find anything. All this stuff you guys have been able to find has been really mind-opening mm -hmm. as to who my grandparents were, who my dad has ended up becoming because of, you know, this situation definitely had an impact, I think. For years after leaving the community of Citrus Heights, the scene that he had stumbled upon remained etched in his memory like a horrible nightmare that he couldn't forget. His witness statement, his complete lack of any criminal history, his impeccable military service, and a solid alibi were all thoroughly examined and found to be consistent and credible. Vandegrift's family, too, had cooperated fully, providing invaluable insight into his character and even his whereabouts at the estimated time of the crime. With Vandegrift definitively ruled out, our quest for answers marches forward, propelled by a renewed sense of purpose and determination. And his mom is a hero, man. She, what she went through in those two year period, you know, losing her little boy and then her husband, it's just horrifying. I remember her as being really pretty too. She was really, really nice. She's so young. And kids. The only thing I think that it really did change our neighborhood an awful lot because people did become so suspicious. I mean, how do you look at your neighbors and think, could this person have killed somebody? But you know what? I was talking to dad yesterday because dad really said to me that they thought it was, a, he really was under the impression that it was the carnival or, you know, whatever. Yeah. He just, whatever grandma told him that or whatever. And I said, it's just so scary to think that if it was someone in the neighborhood that still continued to live there, I go, it's just scary to think that you guys lived amongst somebody that was capable of doing that. My dad was yeah. only six, so it's yeah. like he needed, that's what all he his brain simple, could handle. Simple yeah. explanation. And he just kept, that's what he knew, that's what he heard, that's what it is. Yeah. So I said, isn't that scary, Dad? And he's like, mm, I don't know. I feel like whoever did it, it, he wasn't their only victim. Nobody would ever do something like that just once. But as one chapter closes, Another chapter opens, revealing some startling revelations about Jimmy's next-door neighbors, the Garo Boys, 
who live next door to Jimmy and the Gall family. Join us in our next episode as we delve into the dark underbelly of sexual deviance, the Boy Scout perversion files, pedophilia, and murder, shedding light on a sinister truth hidden within the shadows of the Citrus Heights, California community, a secret so dark that either no one knew or no one talked about. Tune in as we continue to peel back the layers of the chilling secrets that the family next door didn't want you to know as we continue our journey to find justice for Jimmy Gall. And that's a wrap on today's investigation, fellow detectives. If you found this episode both enlightening and captivating, then please subscribe to our podcast show and our Patreon. Leave a review and hit that like button. Share our podcast with others and engage with us on our website and social media platforms. You can find us on all major podcast platforms as well as our website at www.bodyofcrimepodcast.com where you can access all of our episodes and bonus content, including valuable resources. By expanding our community, we believe we can make a greater impact in our pursuit of truth and in shedding light on crucial cases. If there's a case that you'd like for us to cover or a personal story you'd like to share, please don't hesitate and contact us through our website. We always welcome your feedback and suggestions. Until next time, stay sharp, and thank you for tuning in to the Body of Crime Podcast. Podcast. Bye.